many boarding house owners were shocked to receive a notice through the post telling them they had a week to get out of their houses and to leave everything behind except their most personal possessions. At the outbreak of war, as at any other time, there were lots of foreign nationals living in Britain and the government had to decide who was a risk and who wasn't. Their first reaction was to round up everyone who was from a hostile country, such as Germany or Austria, and put them behind barbed wire in internment camps. These were being hurriedly constructed throughout the UK, and here on the island they used the local boarding houses, and that's why everyone had to move out so quickly. All sorts of people arrived on the island as internees, young, old, men and women, and the first of them arrived here, at Ramsey Pier, and they were taken to the empty boarding houses on the North Promenade, which were being encased in huge barbed wire fences with sentries along their length. This was the island's first internment camp, and many more were to follow. There were camps throughout the island, and within a few months of the start of war, the towns and villages were transformed. The camp in Ramsey was the Murich camp, in the area between the park and the sea. There was a camp in Onken based around Royal Avenue, and, like elsewhere on the island, the owners were given very little notice to gather their belongings and find somewhere else to live. There were five camps along Douglas Promenade, the Metropole, Palace, Central and Sefton camps, and the Granville and Regent camps, which were combined into one, not used for internees, but in fact used as a naval radar training school. Finally in Douglas, there was a camp off Broadway, in Hutchinson Square. Across on the other coast, there was a camp in Peel, the Peveril Camp, at the north end of the promenade. All of these camps were for men only, but down south there was the Russian camp for women and children, in Port Erin and Port St Mary. In fact, for a time the whole of the southern end of the island was cut off with a barbed wire fence, running across from Fleshock to Gansey. Eventually though, Port St Mary became a separate camp for married internees, and the land between the two villages was opened again to the public. It was the sight of these people coming to live in these boarding houses, which usually catered for happy holidaymakers, that really brought it home to the Manx that this was for real, and that the island would soon be a very different place that couldn't avoid the impact of war. For security reasons, taking photographs during the war years was strictly prohibited. You could be fined if you were caught photographing these sensitive areas. It was thought you might be helping the enemy. Indeed, one visitor to the island was hauled up in court and fined for his trouble. Because of these restrictions, there are only a few rare images of these camps. The barbed wire made a striking difference to the towns. In Ramsey, most of North Shore Road was closed off. In Douglas, you could see the internees washing hanging from the windows, and the fences ran down the centre of the road with sentry boxes positioned at regular intervals. Off the prom, Empress Drive was impassable, and Hutchinson Square was closed off entirely. Amazingly, more than 70 years later, you can still see traces of some of these camps. This terrace here was made into the palace camp, and the fence ran down the middle of the road over there. You can still see the squares in the tarmac where the posts that held the barbed wire fence once stood. There's more evidence of the camps behind the hotels. In the back lane, you can still see old railway lines sticking out of the cliff. These had rolls of barbed wire attached to them to stop the internees climbing the cliffs to escape. Looking out from the backs of the hotels, the climb to freedom must have seemed very tempting. In Hutchinson Square in Upper Douglas, there are still actual pieces of the barbed wire that form the perimeter of the camp. And on the Murat Promenade in Ramsey, where that first camp was opened, the filled-in post holes are still visible. Imagine then, the promenade fenced off with barbed wire, the hoteliers thrown out of their boarding houses and told they had to find somewhere else to live, and in these buildings, thousands of disgruntled prisoners who were locked up for, well, they didn't know how long. There were Germans, Austrians, Italians and Finns interned on the island, and although many of them were released soon afterwards, 
when it was realised that they were as opposed to Hitler as any British person, many had to stay here for the duration of the war. In some camps there were gifted artists and writers, many of whom had established reputations, and in the Hutchinson Square camp particularly, there was a flourishing artistic community, producing exceptional work which is now valued around the world. But there were everyday things to deal with as well. The internees were responsible for their own cooking, washing and the general day-to-day -day running of the camp. And in the Hutchinson camp, the barbed wire proved useful on wash day. Things were different in the women and children's camp down south. The people of Port St Mary and Port Erin were allowed to stay in their homes, even though they were inside the barbed wire, and the internees were billeted on local families who were paid a guinea a week for each internee. If you happened to be already running a boarding house, then it was like having permanent paying guests. There was entertainment for the children and schooling, and the beach was an ideal place for daily exercises. Providing all the needs for so many thousands of internees required considerable organisation. Local businesses were asked to tender to supply tons of food on a regular basis. There was a need for male typists and letter sensors, and there were the necessities such as carbolic soap and toilet paper, a sample of which had to be submitted for approval. But there was also great resentment amongst some locals that the internees were being supplied with food, beer and generally being looked after, whilst people outside the camps had to deal with war shortages and rationing. It was also noted that women in the camps were given an allowance of 21 shillings a day and access to golf, tennis and the swimming baths, whilst the wife of a soldier serving in the army got an allowance of only 17 shillings a day and the Isle of Man Examiner's opinion column had other complaints as well. I think you will agree that this takes the biscuit. The commandant of an alien camp in the island, I daren't be any more precise on account of the new censorship restrictions, has made an appeal for old tennis balls and other equipment, for outdoor games, parlour games and playing cards for the use of the internees in the camp. That didn't go down very well. So there was some advice on hand. It's a pity the Commandant confined himself to old tennis balls. I'm sure it would be much nicer for the aliens, poor things, to have brand new ones. They bounce ever so much better. A hint of sarcasm? What with sea and sunbathing, our alien guests are having the time of their lives over here. And probably they're wondering why the government was so thoughtless as to leave them at liberty for so long. Ouch! But whilst many aliens played sport, organised concert parties or produced great works of art, others were happy going out into the countryside and working as labourers on the farms. It's said that the Italians from the Metropole camp over there were some of the best workers and many friendships were formed with local people. As you'd expect, with so many internees here on the Isle of Man, there were some who would attempt to escape. In fact, there were 57 recorded instances, though none were free for more than a few days. They were caught and taken back to the camps. But one of the most ingenious attempts was from here in Peel. In 1940, the Peel camp housed some particularly difficult men. They were fascists anti-British and were regarded as traitors and were out to make trouble. The Craig Mallin Hotel at the northern end of Peel Promenade was the camp headquarters and a special detachment of London police were billeted here after a particularly nasty riot which shook the people of Peel in 1940. One night after violent disturbances and yelling and shouting lots of the lights were put on which reflected out to sea. The newspapers claimed that this put the people of the island in grave danger, as the lights could provide a target for passing bombers. The barbed wire fence of the camp ran up the side of the hotel and included a section of the northern part of Peel. This photograph from the period clearly shows part of the fence. 
The camp included the northern part of the promenade, where the present-day bowling green and tennis courts are, and this was the recreation area. The barbed wire fence of the Peel camp ran up Peveril Road here, and these houses were inside the camp, occupied by internees. Across there, there was another barbed wire enclosure, which contained the guardhouse at the entrance to the camp. The guardhouse was also surrounded by barbed wire, but the steps, though close to both fences, were actually on the outside of the wire. It was whilst walking up these steps, opposite number 17, that an army officer, on his way back to the guardhouse, felt his foot sink into the ground, right here. He prodded the grass and found it had been cut and replaced, and that underneath lay a flimsy trapdoor. Below that, he discovered a hole, about four feet deep, with a ladder going down into it. When officers explored the hole, they discovered it led to a tunnel, which went under the road and eventually came up in the front room of the house opposite. They lifted the flooring and discovered the joists had been cut away to allow access to the tunnel, the soil from which had been cleverly removed and spread on the garden behind the house. In fact, it was only a few days before the chance discovery of this tunnel that three men had escaped this camp and made it as far as Castletown. And because all motorboats in harbours had to be disabled during the war by having their spark plugs removed, the men had stolen some oars and got out to sea before they were arrested by a naval patrol boat and brought back to Peel. The captured men were paraded in front of the newspaper cameras as they were sent to prison, and there was little sympathy for them from local residents who were very unhappy about the Peel camp. Although it was never established whether they used this tunnel to escape, I'd like to think they did. Its entrances were soon sealed up to prevent any further attempts. As a footnote to the time when Peel housed those Nazi sympathisers, at least one of the buildings still has some graffiti in it. Although painted over many times, the outline of a swastika is still faintly visible. Eventually, as the war came to an end, the internees were shipped off the island either back to their homes in the UK or back to the countries of their birth. Those returning to Germany found many of its cities completely in ruins, and one can hardly imagine what it must have been like returning to that. <laughs>